Good morning. Today I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you, Esteban. What a great weekend. There's still a boat that's wrecked in the back, in case you didn't see that. But it's been a great time with all the kids who were here and uh, all the questions that were going on and uh, the different people who studied and some who didn't study. You know, I was kind of amazed. You know, there are some that did exceptionally well. I mean, out of 25, they were getting 24, 23, and then there's the kid who got three. I mean, even if you just picked all Bs, you'd do better than that. I, mean, I don't know quite how you could do that, but uh, it was good to have them all here. It was good to see them all here and uh, to realize that they're here to talk about God and to, to study and to have friends, and, and it's just a great time. Brad does a great job with that. Renda also does a great job with that. I mean, it doesn't happen without those two, and uh, they just did a fantastic job, and they hate for anybody to mention it, so make sure you go tell them. <laughs> so it's been really a good time. I wanted to talk to you about coming to Jesus. I don't know if you've heard that phrase, there's a come to Jesus moment. Uh, it's fairly recent. We don't see that very often. Uh, you're not going to find it in a dictionary unless it's an urban dictionary, so I have to give you a little bit of context of where it is. So this is what I found on a come to Jesus moment. It's an epiphany in which one realizes the truth of a matter, a sudden intuitive perception or insight into the reality of essential meaning of something coming. It's coming clean at admitting to your fa failures. It's realizing the true weight or impact of a negative situation or fact. It's acknowledgement that one must get back to the core values. It's a moment of realization. It's an aha moment. It's a moment of decision, a moment of truth, a critical moment, a moment of assessing priorities, a turning point, and it's a life-changing moment. So if any of those register with you, if you've had a moment like that, that's what they call a come-to-Jesus moment. And it gets used a lot of times in a completely non-religious way. That uh, a politician had a come to Jesus moment when, okay, now he's faced with the fact that somebody's caught him. And that's what they call that. Well, that same thing happens with us. Sometimes we get caught and we feel like there's a come to Jesus moment. And that's just the way it's talked about in our world today. But I want you to be able to realize what it really looks like. And so let's talk about what the Bible says about some of these things. If you look at Matthew 11, the first part of the chapter is about John the Baptist. And so Jesus has been talking about him and saying what a great person he was, that there were no greater prophets and no greater person in the Old Testament than John the Baptist. But that the people now don't seem to understand and don't seem to believe in John. And so he pronounces a woe upon the people because they're just not repenting. They don't realize the great things that have been happening all around them in their life. And so they don't get any come to Jesus moment. They're just there and, you know, they don't really quite understand. And then Jesus makes it so very, very simple. I think this passage is the gospel. This is the whole thing, right here. And this is Jesus preaching his own gospel. This is what it is. Sometimes we don't see it that way, but I think this is one of the most powerful passages that we have. And so let's go through this for just a little bit today. So it's an invitation. He says, I want you to come to me, but not just open to everybody, here he's going to mention specific people. Now, yes, everyone can come, but generally it's going to be the people who are weary from their work, that they have burdens too big to bear, too many sins and too much sorrow and fatigue and grief and failure and all those things, because that's when we start thinking about it. Too many 
stressful situations in their life. And they realize that we've done it wrong. That their life didn't turn out like they thought. And it's not just a matter of saying, well, yes, I've committed a sin. I hope no one catches me. Or yes, I committed a sin and yes, someone knows about it. And so I guess I need to repent of that one. It's not like that at all. It's the realization that all of your life has been wrong. The whole thing. Everything you've thought, everything you've said, everything you've done, it feels like the whole thing has been wrong. And you've got to find some way out. You've got to find some rest. You realize, I don't want to have a life like that. I want somebody else's life. And you just feel like you just can't take it anymore. Jesus says, come to me then, and I will give you rest. And it's not just a rest from fatigue. It's not just a rest that says, uh, you know, you'll feel better in the morning. It's a rest from guilt. It's a rest from shame. It's a rest from the things that we've done that are wrong, and it's a rest from being defensive about it because that's what we usually do. When we realize our life doesn't quite measure up, we start saying, well, it's not my fault. It's, you know, and then we start blaming either the, the family, the boss, you know, the situation, everything else but us. It's all somebody else's fault. What if you didn't have to pretend? What if you know you're guilty and you didn't have to pretend anymore? You could just say, yeah, it is my fault. I am all wrong. Everything about my life has been wrong. And I've been trying not to let anyone see that there is so much guilt and shame and mistake. But he says, you don't try to hide that anymore. That your fear is exposed, you're wrong, you're sin, and we just don't try to pretend it isn't us because it's pretty obvious that it is. And then Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. And when you ever come to that position where you feel like everything in your life has possibly been wrong, when somebody says, I'm gentle and lowly in heart, it means that he's not out to accuse you. He's not out to jump all over you for the fact that you've been wrong, and he doesn't really want to blame us. He isn't trying to make sure that everybody else in the world knows what a loser we are. And they can give examples and cite all kinds of situations, and he doesn't yell about our sins. He just lets us confess our sins rather than trying to blame us. And he doesn't try and do it for us. He says, I already know what they are. Do you want to tell them to me? And doesn't it feel better when we can just say to him, this is who I am? And then he says, I want you to learn from me. I mean, obviously you're doing it wrong, and so it's time that we learn how to do something better. And so he says, I want you to learn from me. Learn how to do it right. You aren't okay like you are. Because you don't get this much mess in your life without saying something's wrong, and I think the thing wrong is me. And when the thing wrong is me, then i got to learn how to do this better. You need a change, and so you have to admit some things in your life when you know that so that we can learn how to do it better. And then he says two things. I have a yoke and I have a burden. Take my yoke, learn of me. My burden is light, my burden is easy. So what is he talking about with those things? Well, first let me explain what the yoke is, and you may have understood this. We don't see this very often today unless you go to El Salvador or Honduras or places like that because they actually still have all of these things. This is a yoke. Now, it's not in use. It's just hanging on the wall. But uh, your head goes in one side of that. Okay? Or if you're going to yoke two things together, and that's really what it is, to put things, two things together so that you have the strength of both. And that's really what it's all about. A yoke is to tie them together. And, of course, that's a pretty good-sized chunk of wood there. It means you're not going to get away. And you just put it around your neck, which means you're not going to get away, right? Well, it gets used for oxen for situations where they're plowing together. And especially you would use that if you have one of the oxen, which is a very young ox and really doesn't know but has lots of energy, and he's going to go out and he's going to plow that whole field. And, he, you know, after about an hour, he's done. And you've got an older ox, and he's plowed that field a lot of times, and he's, 
he knows that we're going to be at this all day. So maybe you better pace yourself. And they yoke the two of those together so that they get the strength of one and the experience of the other. And you get something that is so much better. And so Jesus says, take my yoke. Yeah, your head goes in one side, his head goes in the other side. And we are permanently yoked to Jesus Christ. Because that's what the yoke is for. It bonds us to him. It makes us a part of him. We do not move without him. And every place we go and everything we say and everything we do is tied specifically with him right next to us. And I think sometimes if we put that kind of a yoke on, it might give us a reminder sometime that uh, you realize he's watching, you realize he's listening, you realize he's right there, he can see all of this. You can't hide, he's not someone that you can ignore. And this especially is true when we see this whole idea of being yoked with Jesus. And so we also have this burden. He says, both my yoke and my burden are easy and light. You see, there are things we do as Christians, things we don't compromise. And that's why you're here today, right? Because Christians worship. And that's one of the things God wants and God asks for. He is seeking people to be his worshipers, people who would worship in spirit and truth. He's looking for people who will worship him. And, of course, that's where we are, and that's where he brings us to is this whole idea that we are worshipers are his. And this yoke ties us together to be able to do his work. So Jesus says, take up my yoke. And we are part of him. We are part of his body. It refers to it that way. Or you might think of it this way. The cross is really the yoke of Jesus Christ. And very often that cross beam of a cross was thought of as a yoke because it looks exactly the same. It's a chunk of wood that's pretty good size. It's going to be tied to you for life. And the same beam that held oxen or prisoners held Jesus. And because of that cross, we are able to have a yoke with him where we become Christians and we are bound to Jesus. We are tied to him. Our sins become his sins. Our death becomes his death. And his death becomes ours. And his life becomes our life. I think that's the most evangelistic passage in the whole Bible. When we realize what he's saying about these things, about sharing this yoke and this burden of Christ so that people can actually find rest from all the mess and all the things that are going on in this world and all the places where they've been. And he says, that's really the gospel. That's the whole thing. That's all of it. And we keep hiding and saying, well, I don't really need it. I'm doing pretty good. I'm pretty successful, but we're really not. Our relationships fail and business goes up and down and, you know, it's not counted on how much money you got anyway. And sometimes we feel better about ourselves and sometimes we do better. And sometimes we don't do quite so well. But I think that's what he's trying to do with all of this. So let me give you an example of someone who has this situation and they have a come to Jesus moment. And I think one of the ones who's most impressive in the New Testament is Saul. And so if you look at what happens with him, it says, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against his disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue of Damascus, so that if he found anything belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and it will be told you what you are to do. And the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. And so they led him 
by the hand, and they brought him to Damascus, and for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. I think that's a pretty good come to Jesus moment, right? Because Jesus actually shows up, and he says, you're doing it wrong. I mean, what would give you a clue that Saul was doing it wrong? That first line, I mean, it seems like he is still, when your breath is murder breath, you ever had murder breath? Okay? I mean, this isn't just, you know, sleep breath and overnight breath. And this, I mean, this is really bad. Because everything that comes out of your mouth is threats and murder and anger and hatred of all these things. And some people have murder breath. He says, well, when that is what's coming out of you, there's something wrong. Now, you can look at Paul and say, this is one of the most successful guys there ever was. I mean, he's at the top of his profession. He's a Pharisee of Pharisees. He's one of the guys most respected by the law. And that's his life? His life is a life that's full of threats and murder and anger and hatred? I think maybe you need to come to Jesus' moment like that. If that's who your life is and what your existence is all about, it doesn't matter how successful you are, you don't have any rest. You have nothing but violence going on in your own life. And the gospel is all about that, as you know with Saul. And Jesus comes personally to him. And so this is a very definite come to Jesus moment. And he appears to him and he says to him one simple thing. Why are you persecuting me? Is that an accusation? It's kind of a statement of fact. <laughs> would that bother you? It would bother me if he thought I was persecuting him. You see, Saul thought that he could change the world. In fact, it was his responsibility to change the world. In fact, the world's going to be a better place when I get done with it. And it might mean killing a few people, like a few thousand people, because we've got to get rid of all these Christians so that we can have the world the way it is supposed to be, because after all, I am master of the world. And when you get that kind of anger and that kind of hatred, you realize you don't control things. But you are so full of all of the oppression and all of the things that sin would do to you that would say, it's up to you to fix it. It's your way. You do the things that you need. And all of that anger comes out. And Jesus' simple question is, why are you persecuting me? Well, it's a confrontation. He's caught right in the act of doing it. I mean, if he says, well, no, I wasn't doing that. Well, what's the letters in your pouch there, Paul? Well, yeah, they're so that I can do violence to other people. But Jesus doesn't do violence back. Interesting how that works, isn't it? He doesn't yell at him. He doesn't fuss at him. He says, you know, he says, well, who are you? He says, I'm Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting, by the way. Why would that make a difference? Because Jesus isn't shrinking back at all. He's just standing right in front of him going, yeah, I'm the guy you're persecuting. And he's confronting him with it. No, you're supposed to run away if I'm persecuting you. And then I can say, look, he's running away. And I can feel better about how strong I am. And Jesus doesn't. Stands right there. Uh, you're, you're persecuting me. Why? Why? Think about it, Paul. Why? Why would you do that with your life? Why would you make that your life aim is just to persecute me? And as you look at this whole thing, Jesus says, why don't you go into the city and it'll be told what you should do? It's not something he can defend against because he is doing that. And so Jesus first calls and then he is, sends an explanation. This is a gospel story. This is really what it's all about. And Saul is humbled before Jesus. He's also blinded before Jesus. And so he doesn't see for the next three days. 
He also doesn't eat for the next three days, but that's really his choice. Jesus didn't say to him, you can't eat, but that's his response. And he's saying, my life is wrong. Everything about my life is wrong. It isn't like, well, okay, just, you know, cut down on the persecution a little bit. You know, just, just throw five people in jail this week instead of 50. Let's just cut back a little bit. You know, only kill two people this month. Don't, don't do like you normally do. And that's how we normally want to deal with sin. Well, let's just cut back a little bit. See, a come to Jesus moment is my whole life is wrong. And that's where Saul finds himself. Everything about it, everything I stand for, I stand for Jewish law, I stand for God, I stand for all the way in which God would do it, and I am his avenging angel. And he realizes he's not his avenging angel. In fact, he's found himself on the other side persecuting God. Does that sound like repentance? I'm not going to eat, God, until I can get this figured out. Because I'm going to go into Damascus, and I'm going to sit there, and I'm going to wait until you can tell me what comes next in my life. Because I know the rest of it has been all wrong to this point. And Ananias is sent to Paul to tell him what to do. Now, Ananias doesn't want to go. He says, I've heard about this guy. I don't think that's good. I've heard he's a persecutor of Christians, and I had thrown him in jail and killed him, and I don't want to do that. He's got murder breath. I don't want to be a part of that. He says, well, no, you need to go, because I chose you, and I also chose him. It's your come to Jesus moment, too, Ananias. Come on. Don't be afraid. I'm sending you. And God does that every single time. Yes, he might confront a person with a disaster in their life. But the way they find out what to do next is up to us. Because he's going to send them to us and say, you explain what gospel's like. And it's so neat to watch what Ananias does here in chapter 9, down in verse 17. So Ananias departed, he entered the house, and in laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you have come, sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. And then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. And for some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus. And so as Ananias goes, he says, I'm here for two reasons. One is, you're blind right now, and I'm sent to regain your sight. The other is, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And God has sent me to accomplish those two things. And so by laying his hands on his eyes, there is something like scales that falls from his eyes, and he's able to see again. And then he says, we need to baptize you. What? Why? No, the second reason I'm here is because you need to be filled with the Spirit of God, and there's no way you can be filled with the Spirit of God in the condition that you're in. And so you need to have those sins taken away. And so we need to go, and we're going to immerse you in water. And what that means is you're being immersed into the death of Jesus Christ it brings you in contact with his blood so that as you're raised from the dead you're going to be raised to a new life so as you come out of that water Paul you're going to be a whole new person again and your life will be different I need you to believe that now before it happens don't wait till after and say all I feel is wet that's got to be your faith going into it that you absolutely believe that that's what is going to happen. And that's what Saul does. Of course, after three days of not eating and three days of blindness, maybe you're ready for about anything. And he says, this is really easy. 
You get the Holy Spirit by surrendering yourself. The baptism yokes you with Jesus Christ. It yokes you with his cross because it's the point at which you contact that blood. And then the Spirit of God is able to come in and to fill your life and to give you this whole new perspective, this whole new direction where you're not a guy who breathes threats and murder against God and against his Savior. You're a guy who stands up for him and worships him. And so we know that that's the conversation that took place because in Acts 22, 16, as Paul's telling the story about that, he says, he, you know, why do you wait? Here's what Ananias said to me, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. That's what Ananias said. And so at that point, sins are washed away. So that Holy Spirit's able to come in. And it is how we call on the name of the Lord is by that repentance, by that baptism. And that's the way that that all takes place. It's a release of sin. And now the Holy Spirit's able to be part of his life. And he immediately begins to associate with disciples there. He's not just left on his own. All right, got that done. We're through. No, you're yoked to Jesus. Now what comes next? He says, well, i got to be with these guys. Absolutely. So he immediately begins to associate with disciples there. So he goes to worship there. He goes to Bible class. It's not long before he's teaching the Bible class because, after all, he's an Old Testament professor. That's the only scriptures they've got. He says, well, I know stuff about this. Let me explain to you. And he start, kind of has to reorient his whole thinking because it's all been around a future coming Messiah. Now it's got to go back to it's an already come Messiah. And Jesus has fulfilled all of that prophecy. And as Saul begins to study and begins to learn and begins to teach, he becomes part of that congregation. This is a gospel story, right? This is the whole thing. This is all of it. This is what the whole thing is about. Because that same gospel is in everything else. We see distressed and upset people in their lives. They have an encounter with Jesus. They realize that they are wrong. And that the things in their life is wrong. The direction, everything in their life is wrong. And they fi try to find a different way. And Jesus sends someone to show them a different life. Ananias comes to baptize Saul. And he gets involved in church. Is that story familiar? I hope it is. It's the same story as a prodigal son. It's about a man who is distressed and destroyed by his own doing. He took his fortune, went away to another place, and was able to spend his money any way he wanted because that just means you destroyed yourself. And after you'd wasted all your money and it's all gone and you have nothing left at all, and now you're sitting in the pig pen trying to feed pigs that you're not even supposed to be around or touch and you don't even have food to eat and the pig's got more food than you. And you realize what he does. He says, my life is all wrong. I've got to do this better. I'm going to go back and tell my father, I don't deserve to be a son, but can I be hired at your place? I'll be your servant. I'll be your slave. I don't have any reason for you to hire me, but I know you've got a big farm, and I know the farm well, and I can work it for you. But he doesn't even get all the way there. Because the father comes running. And he has to be a servant with no privilege. And the father says, no. But I will make you a son. And so he gives him a ring and a robe and a calf. He gives him rest. He gives him a place in the father's house. He gives him rest that he's never had before. Because before he was the angry young man who's never satisfied with anything. The life isn't right. The life isn't fair. There's better things out there and I am stuck here on this stupid farm. And when that's your attitude and that's the way you think about your life, you are all wrong. 
And it wasn't until he had gone out and destroyed it all that he realized, you know what, everything in my life has been wrong. And the way I felt about the father and the farm before that, as well as all the way I spent the money and everything that I've done has been wrong. And so he said, let me just be the servant. He says, no way. You get a place of rest. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to talk about as he tells any of those stories. Zacchaeus is the same story. You can go through every single one of the New Testament stories and look at those, and those are all the same story. It's a story about the gospel, that we have been weary and heavy laden and distressed and upset by life and been failed and destroyed, and Jesus offers rest. He does not offer success. He does not help you with your business. He does not help you get ahead in life. But when we surrender to Jesus, we find peace. We don't find success, and he is not going to help you with that. You may be successful on your own, but it is in accepting the yoke of Jesus and being coupled with him, and you realize the yoke fits. It fits perfect. You ever had shoes that fit? I mean, you can run forever in them, right? Now, you know how those other shoes are. I mean, they don't fit well, and they rub blisters and everything else. Doesn't matter how far you walk, but there's some of those shoes that are just so perfect. You feel like you could float. You feel like you can just run and run and run. Of course, you have to remember back several years probably. The older we get, no shoes fit anymore. <laughs> but that yoke fits like that. It feels like life is right again. Because you know you're going the right direction and you know you're coupled with Jesus Christ and it's a permanent tie to who he is. And that sin has destroyed so much and we can't get what we want and it just leaves us empty with no meaning whatsoever. It destroys relationships and it destroys everything we try to do in our life. And we realize Jesus died on a cross for us and he paid for our sins and that, that cross is a yoke. And then if we're willing to be tied to Jesus by that cross as we take up our cross and follow him, it frees us. And we learn from him and we learn his ways and his world. And he gives us a world of grace, not of rules. Not of mistakes, not of devastation, but a world of grace. You see, the passage is very simple. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I'm gentle and humble in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. And so Jesus gives you a yoke of redemption. And you respond to the weight of grace. Because Jesus loved us and he ran to us and he died for us before we even ask. He's the redeeming sacrifice. He's the creator of the world. He's the one who gives the spirit. And he gives life in such a quality that we call it eternal life. Jesus is in the surrender to God. And God is highly exalting him. And if we're linked with Jesus, then God is highly exalting us as we are linked with him. And we become part of this highly exalting that God is doing for Jesus Christ. And we're seated in heavenly places and we become to the praise of his glory and we have the burden of majesty, the burden of glory, the burden of honor. We're friends with a savior. We're friends with a redeemer. We're friends with the greatest lover the world has ever known. And we all tried to do it the wrong way. Because after all, God doesn't make us prodigal after being in sin. He makes us sons. Well, that's one way the verse is read. Let me show you what the message says. Not exactly the translation I would use, but maybe it helps us get it. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. He makes us sons. Rings and robes. And we have the burden of a savior. The burden of being saved. So what's the burden of being saved to a drowning man? 
you have to breathe. You have to get your own air, and you can't stop swimming. You cannot give up. You have to keep going. Otherwise, it doesn't matter if somebody pulls you out. You won't make it. And we realize someone has risked their life to save us. And how are you going to respond to that? You've been persecuting me. I think Jesus might look at a lot of us and say, you've been persecuting yourself. Why are you doing that to yourself? Because of all the anger and hatred and trouble that you find in your life, do you want that? I mean, you can just keep going with it if you want to. But if you'll come to me, I'll give you rest. And you'll be able to find that yoke. It's a yoke to his burdens. It's a yoke to his glory. It's a yoke to his holiness. And it's a yoke that allows us to give up our sin and say, I'll be baptized into you, Jesus Christ. And that forms that covenant, that bond, that yoke. And he says, and I will give you relief and rest and forgiveness so that you are able to find this true joy that's in Jesus Christ. What a gospel we have. Isn't that a great story? We just need to tell it more. What a great thing we have. Maybe today you don't have that. And you're realizing, well, my life is about all the burden and all the problem and all the things going long and wrong. And Jesus is going to you, why are you persecuting yourself? Maybe you've got to come to Jesus' moment. It's time that you did. So why don't you come to Jesus? We're going to stand and sing. We'll meet you in the front.